Hello everybody and welcome to the next part of the serial killer iceberg. For one, I am not in my usual place. I am on vacation, so I had to make a makeshift corner for this. But I wanted to get this video out to you guys as soon as possible, so here we are. Also, yes, why this is the next part of the serial killer iceberg, this entire video is going to be over only one tier and I'm gonna explain why. If I had to guess the way that the tiers are segmented for this iceberg, they're by different categories of serial killers, and if that's true, this has to be the weird ones. Like, to give you an idea in my notebook, normally an episode of, say, The Conspiracy Theory Iceberg will take up maybe three quarters of a page or one page. This one tier of the serial killer iceberg was two full pages because there's so many weird details that it would be criminal to leave them out. Like, for real, some of the details about these killings make people like Ted Bundy look like just a loser in comparison. I mean, he was a loser, but even more of a loser, but you get what I mean. So even though I wanted to do two or three tiers for this video, given how long I figured this would take or how long you can tell it would take by the time of the video, so much research went into this and I wanted to do it right because again, you all are gonna wanna hear this. I figured I'd just do this video about all of the weird ones because I'm sure that you guys would like to get into the weird details rather than me just leaving you here all wet. All wet. All wet. Hey everyone, so I know what you're thinking. Why isn't he wearing the shirt? Why is his hair messed up? Why does he look wet? And it's because I am because I just fell into a lake. And no, I'm not kidding. I was on a jet ski and the jet ski kept going and I did not. Don't worry, it was only almost a tragedy and everything's fine now. But whenever I fell into the water, I got all my stuff wet. I got my electronic keys wet. I got my cards wet, which is Cool. But guess what stayed dry and stayed working through the whole thing? That's right, my Raycon earbuds. I'm gonna finish the rest of this in normal clothes because I'm cold and in pain. All right, that's better. So I actually owned a pair of Raycons before Raycon sent me another pair to do the ad with. And I can say that in my experience, both of them have worked fantastic. The reason I got Raycons originally is because whenever I do stuff like go to the gym or fall out of a moving boat, I was tired of wires and other kind of headphones always either getting in my way or falling off. Whereas the Raycon itself is made to comfortably fit into your ear and both be not a hindrance as well as give you good sound clarity without you worried about where your wires are going. I listen to all sorts of music, so either it be something that I want to hear specific background chords or heavy bass, Raycons have got me covered on every end of the audio spectrum. See, Raycons themselves were actually originally developed by Ray J, and they're used to this day by big music producers like Snoop Dogg, so these people absolutely understand good audio quality. They come in a variety of colors and advertise that they have a six hour audio life. However, that's gotta be like with it maxed out because I will put these things on charge at the beginning of the week and not worry about them for the rest of it. So it's time to move away from wired headphones and get with wireless earbuds because Raycon are offering their products at half the price of their competitors. So I've teamed up with Raycon to offer you this deal. If you go to the link in the description or buyraycon.com forward slash Wendigoon, you will be able to get your purchase for 15% off. And yes, that's 15% off the already discounted price that these things normally come at. So this is as good as a deal as ever, and it also helps me and the channel, and I greatly appreciate it. So I hope you all decide to go with Raycon. I've used them before, I'm gonna use them after. It's a great deal, and it helps support the channel. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you for Raycon for sponsoring this video. It really does mean a lot, and we are back to the video. So without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get into tier four of the serial killer iceberg. But as always, Thank you for watching. Clifford Olson, also known as the Beast of British Columbia, which there we go with the cool names again, was convicted of the murder of 11 children in the early 1980s. The way he went about most of these killings is he would catch the children either while they were on their own or abduct them from a crowd to which he would strangle them and then leave their body in a secretive location. He was eventually caught by the police in which he made a really weird deal to give up the locations of the bodies of the kids he killed. Clifford made a deal with the Canadian police that he would be given 10,000 Canadian dollars for every body that he shows them. That money would be deposited into a pension fund that would go to his wife and at the time infant son, saying that even though he doesn't care about these children that he murdered, 
He did, however, care about his wife and kid. And for some reason, the police agreed to that deal and ended up giving his wife and son 100,000 Canadian dollars for the 10 bodies that Clifford showed them, although he threw in an 11th one, which he said was a freebie. The public wasn't made initially aware of that deal until the trial, to which people were then outraged that the person who killed their children was given $10,000 for showing the police where the body was. Despite this, nothing changed in the agreement, and Clifford was given a life sentence. But due to the way Canadian law worked at the time, Clifford was eligible for parole after 25 years, so the judge said at the sentencing hearing of the trial that Clifford should never, ever, under any circumstances, be let out. Of course, Clifford still tried for parole, and in his 2006 parole hearing, he said that he should be let go because he gave the United States a warning about 9-11 and that they had granted him clemency for it. Which let me remind you, for one, Clifford was being jailed in Canada, and two, no he didn't. <laughs> you gotta think about it. this is five years after 9-11, and at his parole hearing in which he's supposed to convince a group of people that he is not crazy or a threat to society, he tells them that the United States freed him because he warned them about 9-11. Of course, he wasn't let out for that, but that wasn't the end of his weird prison controversy. After this news got to the public that Clifford had been drawing on essentially a social security system in Canada that applies to people over the age of 65, and that he was basically getting his retirement fund deposited into an account that he could access if he ever got out. So keep in mind, this is the second time that Clifford has got a lot of money from the Canadian government while either on trial or in jail for murdering children. And at this point, the account had been going for several years, so the dude had like 30 grand if he ever got out. But this time, the authorities actually looked into it and was like, hey, we should probably do something, and killed the account. And despite all these shenanigans, Clifford died of natural causes while in prison in 2011. Leonard Lake is responsible for 11 to 25 killings of women, at a remote cabin in California during the mid 80s. As a child, Leonard was raised by his grandmother who had interesting ways of encouraging his behavior. For example, when he was young, he would begin to do things like photograph pictures of the female members of his family while they were naked, like in the shower or something rather. And his grandmother found out about it and encouraged it, apparently, saying it was some artistic expression or whatever. And then he started doing things like melting rats in acid, to which again, his grandma was like, oh, kids and their hobbies. And this steadily building mean streak kept getting bigger and his grandma kept not doing anything about it. This came to a head when while in Vietnam during the war, he had a mental breakdown during a combat mission. For this, Leonard was discharged and sent back home to the US. It was around this time that Leonard got really into the hippie lifestyle and even married a hippie who then later divorced him whenever she found out that he was filming adult movies that she wasn't aware of. It was shortly after this that Leonard befriended another Vietnam vet by the name of Charles Nag to come live with him at this remote cabin in the middle of the woods. It was during this time that Leonard and Charles would get together, kidnap women, bring them in, torture them, do explicit things to them before murdering them, all while recording it similar to the adult films that Leonard used to make. We'll talk in a second about how they got rid of the bodies and all of that, but they probably would have gotten away with it a lot longer if it hadn't been for a really stupid move that Charles made. See, Charles had a track record beforehand of being a petty thief. He would just go to stores and randomly steal stuff. One day, Charles was in a hardware store in which he stole a vice, for some reason, and then left. Charles told Leonard, who said, well, you know, we don't want to hurt the economy or whatever, so Leonard went back to the hardware store to pay for the vice. By the time Leonard got there, the police were there taking up a report from the person behind the counter, so Leonard walks in and says, hey, it was my buddy who stole the vice, let me just pay for it. The police, immediately suspicious, asked for his ID, to which Leonard handed them the ID of one of his murder victims. See, the way that Leonard and Charles would do it is they would catch whole families at a time, murder all of the men, and normally just keep the woman alive for torture. So they had all of these trophies they had accumulated over time. So when Leonard handed the officer a picture of a man who, upon search, had been reported missing for a while, they go outside and take a look in Leonard's car, and sitting in the passenger seat is a pistol with an illegal suppressor on the end of it. So that's 
odd, so they brought Leonard in for questioning. As soon as he got brought in for questioning, he popped four cyanide pills that he had hidden in his jacket and killed himself there in the interrogation room. Or at least he seized up and went comatose. Technically he died four days later, but same difference. Which imagine being the police in this situation. You get a call that a vice has been stolen. So you go there and the guy's like, hey, it was my buddy, let me pay for it. So they're like, why don't you come down to the station and he just kills himself. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, hold on. It wasn't that serious, bro. This gave the police ample opportunity to go back and search his property. And when they did, they arrested Charles who found the full display of what they had been doing. Constructed next to the cabin was a structure that the investigators later called a dungeon that was full of various restraints and torture devices and looked like something out of a horror movie. It was there while searching the property that they figured out that the way the two of them would get rid of their victims is by melting their bodies in acid. Remember how earlier when he was a kid, he would do the same thing to rats? Well, now he does that, but to like, you know, people. What couldn't be melted was then compiled up and then buried around the property itself, which the police began to find. While also searching the property, they found something that was labeled a treasure map, which while following it, they managed to find several barrels that were full of personal effects, clothing, IDs, and stuff like that. As well as in these barrels, they found several videos of the two of them committing these crimes. That's the reason that the murders are 11 to 25, because while yes, they found remains of at least 11 different people on the property, they found personal belongings and identification of much more. Interestingly, Charles Lawyer during the trial didn't ask any questions to the witnesses that came forward and seemingly just threw the case. Now, I can't prove this at all, but my own theory is that it specifically says that he began to stop asking questions and all that after the evidence was brought forward, or in other words, the tapes. So perhaps this lawyer was looking to defend Charles until he saw videos of him torturing and brutalizing these women and from the logs of what was said in the videos, it was pretty brutal. That maybe the lawyer just decided he didn't want to save this guy's life and just let the case carry on. Either way, to this day, Charles is still in prison on death row. Gilbert Paul Jordan, known as the Boozing Barber, which that one's like on the line of goofy and cool, so I'll let it slide, is responsible for the alcohol murders. While it's believed that he killed between eight to 10 women, he has only ever been convicted of one charge of manslaughter. The reason being his murder weapon, as the name suggests, was alcohol. The way he would do this is he would get women to come over to his apartment, most often sex workers, to which he would then pay them to see how much they could drink. Whenever the women inevitably passed out, he would then tilt their head back and pour alcohol down their throats until they died of alcohol poisoning. And that's the reason that even though he murdered like eight to 10 people, they could only ever get him on one charge of manslaughter because it's really hard to prove that, you know, he did that rather than just he was hooking up with someone and they drank too much. Even though while apparent and looking at the evidence, it's very clear he killed these people, especially given the number of people that it happened to. It's hard from like a legal standpoint to say either, oh, you killed this person or, oh, they accidentally killed themselves. Also, the drinking was not exclusive to his victims. It is reported that this guy drank 50 ounces of vodka every day and somehow didn't die of alcohol poisoning himself. After like the eighth death, it became apparent to the police what he was doing. So they started listening in at his house to which he could be heard telling the women, oh, I'll give you $50 if you drink that bottle, but a hundred if you can drink both of them. Actually, I'll just make it 200 if you can drink that and so on and so on. Which for these poor women who most of the time were in a struggling spot anyway in order to make money, this was an offer they couldn't pass up, but sadly led to their end. But as mentioned, they only ever got him on one manslaughter charge to which he served nine years before being released. And then almost as soon as he was released, he got arrested for being at a bar and trying to force alcohol on a woman. To which he pretty much gets a warning, gets back out, and then at a hotel party, almost kills a woman, but her friend managed to get into the room and save her, as he was pouring alcohol down her throat, to which he was only given 15 months for like reckless endangerment. So he gets out and then gets in trouble for doing the exact same thing again 
and gets off with no penalty. I have no idea how you can look at someone who has definitely done it eight to 10 times, tried to do it two more times each after getting arrested, and then now you're sitting there on the third time and you're like, you know what? I think he's innocent. <laughs> However, he eventually died in 2006 of guess what? You guessed it alcohol poisoning. It's pretty pathetic that like such a sicko, despite everyone on this list who like showed proof that if given the chance they would do it again, got the lightest sentencing, like nine years and then the 15 months and released three times between them and he never got any better. So thanks justice system, rehabilitation, cool. Robert Picton was convicted in 2007 of the second degree murder of six women, although that probably isn't even close to how many he actually killed. The police initially wanted to charge him with another 20, and then to an undercover agent who was in jail with Picton, Picton said that he had killed 49 and wanted to kill one more woman to make it an even 50. At a young age, Robert Picton lived with his family on a family-run pig farm. Something that is too weird to not mention is one of the reasons he later said was the cause for his crimes is that at a young age, he really fell in love with like this baby calf and he just had a connection to it. And then, you know, it's a slaughterhouse farm, so one day the calf gets slaughtered and that just like flipped a switch in his mind which i don't necessarily think if a kid loses their pet they just automatically become a serial killer but whatever his word when robert's parents died the control of the pig farm fell on him and his brother but his brother really didn't want anything to do with the slaughterhouse pig side of it so robert picked it up and lived on a trailer on the property deciding to update it a bit robert converted the barn into a sort of bar strip club area that was known as the piggy palace good time society it was a popular place for raves and strip shows at the time and was commonly visited by the hell's angels However, it was during one of these parties that he stabbed one of the strippers to which she took the knife and stabbed him back and they both ended up going to the same hospital. The woman who had a handcuff around her wrist said that it had been Picton who handcuffed her and then tried to stab her to which she managed to wrestle the weapon away and stab him, pointed out that the key to her handcuff was in Picton's pocket to which when the people at the hospital checked it was and they managed to unlock her. However, he never saw a trial for this because no attorney thought that her story would stand up because she tested positive for several drugs and she was a less than desirable candidate. I don't know, you know how the law works. So he pretty much got off of the situation scot-free. However, there was a local police officer who noticed that several of the women who worked on the corners or sex workers who would normally come and talk to him throughout the day began to disappear. He started to think something was weird about this, so he asked one who said that the most recent missing person had went to go check out the old pig place. To which it turned out that several of these women who Picton had picked up to bring back to his property had just disappeared. Given that and the previous stabbing history, the police launched an investigation to which they found several personal effects of those women who went missing on his property. However, his argument was, yeah, they came over, maybe they dropped a card or a purse or whatever. I don't know, stop bothering me. And they can never get anything conclusive because they were never able to find any body parts. To which the absolutely horrifying idea came forward that perhaps because it's a pig farm and perhaps because he ships out meat that he's either using the bodies as food for the pigs or even worse food that he's shipping out. This was such a concern that a notice went out to several of the pork markets in the area to check their meat concentration because it uh, may not be pork. Eventually, the police managed to obtain enough of a warrant that they were able to search his actual trailer, to which they found several of the bloody clothes and effects of the women who went missing. And searching after that, they managed to find skulls and other various bones that were scattered around the property. Also inside the trailer, they found a lot of other weird things, like a bunch of syringes containing a little bit of a blue liquid in them, as well as a pistol that he had placed a rubber anatomical device. 
I think I'm safe on that one. On the end of it, saying it worked as a makeshift suppressor. Another thing they found in the trailer was several videos of Robert with associates talking about what he does to these women, in which he mentioned things like one of the best ways to kill a drug addict is to fill a syringe full of windshield wiper fluid and then have them inject it in themselves thinking it's a drug and that will kill them hence the blue liquid in the syringes that was found as well as videos of him taking the bodies cutting them up and then feeding them to the pigs see for those that don't know uh pigs are all like cute and sweet whenever they're domesticated and around but pigs in the wild are like really feral and by really feral i mean they're not only scavengers but they'll rip bigger animals apart in groups and then eat them so there's kind of a belief on pig farms that don't let them smell your blood or see your blood because they could go rabid at any second so all robert had to do was take these bodies cut them enough so they bleed throw them to the pigs and then throw away whatever they didn't eat. And to you right now who's watching this while eating spaghetti with marinara or meat sauce, uh, you're welcome for that visual. Thankfully, however, he had never sent the body parts off with the meat he was shipping out, so I guess that's one plus. And the reason he was only ever tried for six murders is because all the other murders and stuff around them, the initial 20 that the police wanted to charge him for, were circumstantial as there wasn't actually recorded evidence of their bodies and just some stuff found. And the judge knew that if you take it from six murders to 26 murders, there's more evidence of like a mistrial that could happen, or in other words, the defense could poke holes in more stories. And the judge w just wanted to stick to a solid six so they could lock this guy away for good. However, for some reason, maybe just a really good defense attorney or what, the jurors were like weirdly sympathetic for him. Like there was a bunch of stuff during the trial about, oh, how he couldn't have done that, which never heard that one before. Or like how he doesn't deserve all that, which like, it's, it's gotta be like one of the most brutal serial killers ever. But these people are just like, oh, well. I'm sure he didn't know what he was doing. There was even a point to which the jurors asked the judge if they could rule that he was guilty for it, but that he wasn't responsible for his actions. And not in like an insanity plea way, and like he didn't know what he was doing, like he's a child or something, I don't know. Which is the reason he was only ever eventually given the sentence of six second degree murders because the jury demanded that they take it from first degree murder down to second. But like, so second degree implies that it was a spur of the moment thing and you didn't like plan the killings in advance. But this dude literally had syringes full of the windshield wiper and he hid the bodies and had plans to get rid of them. Like it's his first degree as first degree can get. And even stupider, the sentence for six second degree murders is the same as the sentence for six first degree murders. So he still got life in prison with a chance of parole in 25 years, which he would have got, it, it's so dumb. Either way, Picton is currently serving a life sentence to which he will be first eligible for parole in 2032. So fingers crossed that those jurors are not on the parole board. Wayne Williams was convicted of the murder of two men in 1981, however, as we're gonna talk about in a second, it's possible that the actual murders were up to like 30. See, Wayne Williams was a sort of disc jockey on the radio and had ambitions of being a pop music producer. Around this time, something was going on called the Atlanta Child Murders, in which in the city of Atlanta, there were several children being murdered and their bodies found several days later. And since several of the bodies were found around the same location floating down the river in Atlanta, it was believed that it was all done by one killer. One morning, the police were scoping out a bridge where it was believed the bodies were being disposed of, to which while sitting there, they heard a loud splash, implying that something had just been thrown from the bridge above. The police then race over to the end of the bridge to which the only one on it at the time was Wayne Williams. They pulled him over, asked what he was doing at this hour, to which 
she said he was driving across town to meet a young woman who was about to become a famous singer. He gave them a name and a phone number, which both later turned out to be fake. And sure enough, two days later, they found a body that had sank underwater right at the spot that Wayne had thrown it over, or supposedly Wayne had thrown it over. Because of this, Wayne was brought in, to which he failed three polygraph tests, and his DNA was found on the body of not only that one victim that fell in the water, but another one who had been recently killed that still had DNA remains on him. Not only that, but after Wayne was arrested, the serial killing spree of the Atlanta child murders stopped all at once. And then while at trial, while being questioned on why he did the crimes and being attacked by the prosecution, he got incredibly angry and started yelling and screaming, which supposedly, you know, turned the jury against him. To which he said during the trial that he was being framed by the Atlanta police for a killing that was actually being committed by the Ku Klux Klan. And while several people came forward in years since saying there's no way he could have done it, most of the arguments come down to, well, he was a good guy, so it's impossible that he could have done it, which you know how that goes. So why am I not saying definitively that Wayne killed these people? Well, that's because while there is a lot of evidence showing that he did, there's just enough for my conspiracy theorist mind to not 100% just say, yeah, this is the dude that did it. The main reason for that is a guy by the name of Charles Sanders. See, Charles Sanders was a chief KKK member who was also being investigated for the child murders around the same time. However, of course, whenever they found Wayne and all this happened, they let Charles go, and at the same time, Charles had passed all his polygraph tests. But even though Wayne failed his and Charles passed his, polygraphs aren't 100% perfect, and there's a lot that go into them, so it's not, like, conclusive. And the Atlanta child murders themselves were happening to young black children in Atlanta, which on Wayne's side was seen as just victims of opportunity, but to a KKK leader obviously has racial implications. Also, one of the main things that ended up convicting Wayne is that several of the other victims that were found had traces of not only his DNA, like the two I mentioned before, but traces of his dog's DNA, as well as DNA from his carpet. But because the DNA was so degraded at the point it was retrieved, it's not a 100% exact match. Instead, it's like a 80% match. Like for example, whenever they pulled the DNA from the other people and said it matched Wayne's, it actually was like, down to a percentile of black men who may be living in Atlanta, or it could be someone else. And also the dog hair samples that supposedly matched Wayne's dog that was found on the victims actually just kind of matched that breed of dog. And Charles Sanders supposedly said, thank God we have the same kind of dog and carpet, implying that he is responsible for several of the murders. But that statement itself came from a reporter and it's like third hand information at this point. So there's no way to verify it and it, it's really messy. It's so messy as a matter of fact that last year the Atlanta police announced that they are going to retest Wayne's DNA against the DNA found just to be double sure. Because at this point, like one of the investigators said, it's like 98% sure that Wayne was the killer. However, they want to be 100% sure. And to give you an idea of how convoluted it is, one leading theory is that Wayne committed like half of the Atlanta child murders and either Sanders or someone else committed the other half. Like I said, really murky waters. Herbert Mullen confessed to killing 13 people in the 1970s for some interesting reasons. Herbert was pretty normal growing up and through high school. However, the first signs that something was off was shortly after he graduated high school, one of his close friends died in a car accident, to which Herbert then made a shrine of his friend in his house. He then got this overwhelming fear that he was homosexual because it was the 1960s and that kind of thing was frowned upon. So he let his family place him in a mental institution, although he left shortly afterwards. Shortly after leaving, he did things like beginning to burn himself with cigarettes and he tried to become a priest for a while and then got kicked out of an apartment he was living in because he would be up all night screaming at people who weren't there. And investigators later said that he was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, which 
Yeah, probably. That also wasn't helped by the fact that he was known to smoke weed and take LSD all the time, which I'm sure just made his schizophrenia super fun. It was around this time that voices in his head began to tell him that he had to begin performing human sacrifices to stop earthquakes from hitting the California area. This was around the end of the war in Vietnam, so he said that Vietnam was doing enough of the killing for now, but as soon as the war's over, he needs to start doing the job himself. He killed the first of his victims after he pulled his vehicle on the side of the road and asked a homeless man to come take a look at the engine. While he was looking at the engine, he said he could hear the homeless man speaking into his mind, that the homeless man was Jonah from the Bible and that it was now time to sacrifice him to stop the earthquakes. So Herbert pulled out a baseball bat and beat the man to death on the side of the road. He then murdered a woman before feeling guilty about it and going to a priest to confess his sins. However, in the confessional booth, as he was confessing, he believed that the priest wanted to be the next sacrifice, so he got out of his booth walked over to the priest, stabbed him to death, and then left. Also, the police were none the wiser to this because like, for example, someone saw him running away after stabbing the police, so they just thought that it was a robber for some reason. And shortly after this, Herbert tried to join the Marines so that he could kill more. However, he wasn't allowed to because he failed the drug test. Because he failed his drug test and therefore couldn't do as much killing as he wanted to, he saw that drugs were the reason that he wasn't going to be able to stop the earthquakes. And so he needs to get back at the person who introduced him to drugs. So he decided to track down his high school dealer who first sold him marijuana. He went to the house where the dealer used to live asked the lady who was now living there where to find his address. She gave them the address. So then Herbert drove to the guy's new house, killed him and his wife, before driving back to the original house and murdering that woman and her children. This detail was very damning to him in court because the defense's argument was not guilty by reason of insanity, but the fact that he went back supposedly to cover up evidence that he was ever looking for the dealer in the first place gave the prosecution enough regard to say, he was in charge of his actions. Look, he did this just to cover up evidence. Not long after this, he went to a state park to which there were four teenagers camping there illegally. He said he was a park ranger and that they had to leave. They laughed at him and he shot them all to death, which it's not funny. I'm not trying to make light of it, but imagine being one of those teens and the park ranger's like, hey, you gotta go. And you're like, no, and he just shoots you. <laughs> he was eventually caught while driving through a neighborhood, he saw a man mowing his lawn and just got out of the car, grabbed a rifle, shot him in the front yard with a ton of people watching, slowly got back in his car and just kept driving at a normal speed. And the police caught him like three minutes later to which he didn't even resist arrest and was just like, huh. I wonder how you caught me. He was found guilty and confessed to the murders. And like I said earlier, didn't get away with insanity because he tried to cover up evidence. And one of the weirdest things to mention, while he was in jail, he had a cell for a long time right next to Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer, who is the really tall charismatic guy that I talked about in the first part of the serial killer iceberg. Ed said, that in the early days of Herbert being there, he would keep singing all the time and it annoyed everyone. So he just started splashing water onto Herbert until he quit. And then after that, Ed began giving him peanuts for good behavior. And they kind of got along in that weird relationship, which I'm not trying to make light of like the horrible evil things these men did, but it's so weird to imagine two serial killers and one of them just feeding the other peanuts through the bars. And Herbert Mullen is still in jail to this day. Paul Bernardo is responsible for a lot of sexual crimes. However, has only ever been convicted of three murders that he committed with his wife, Carla Hamalka. At a young age, Paul's father was arrested for child molestation, which it's believed Paul kind of internalized and wanted to be like his dad. Not only this, but Paul began to hate his mother, saying that it was her fault that her dad turned to 
things. Paul also expressed a lot of dangerous signs at a young age. Like for example, when he was in high school and just out of high school, he was known to beat women that he would go out with. That was until he met Carla, who he began to beat and do those things to, and she really liked it. Not only did she like it, she vastly encouraged these violent sexual acts. Around the time he was beginning to know Carla, it's believed that he committed around 18 sexual assaults against women. And then after meeting Carla, it got a lot worse. That started with Tammy, who was Carla's sister. See, despite the fact that Paul and Carla were engaged at this point, Paul kept coming on to Tammy, again, Carla's sister, and Carla enjoyed it. So much so that she would do things like break Tammy's windows, that way Paul could like open them up and watch her sleep. And eventually Carla began drugging Tammy so that Paul could have his way with her. However, Tammy continuously kept waking up during these events, which I'm not sure if Tammy would have been in a frame of mind to recognize what was going on, because even though she was conscious during points when she would sort of come on to Paul and Paul would make out with her or whatever back and forth, it seems she wasn't aware of the extent that Paul was abusing her. This culminated one night in which Carla said for a Christmas gift to Paul, she had completely drugged Tammy so that he could do whatever he wanted. However, she used way too much and during the events that ensued, Tammy threw up and choked to death on her own vomit. Paul and Carla immediately cleaned up the scene, make it look like they were never there, and then called the police, to which when the police got there, they said that Tammy had drank so much that she passed out, and then subsequently threw up and suffocated. And I know this is really gross, but again, this is a serial killer iceberg, what did you expect? As soon as like they took away Tammy's body, Carla dressed up as Tammy and then continued the acts, which is so, ugh. Eventually, Paul and Carla got married, to which for their wedding gift, Carla had picked up a 15-year-old girl who she had drugged as Paul's wedding gift. Now, like I said, they're responsible for the murders of three people, one of those being Tammy. However, it's thought that what happened most of the time is Carla would kidnap a girl who would be unconscious, Paul would do disgusting things, and then they would leave her somewhere to which she wake up and never be the wiser. Or in other words, it seems like the ones that actually died were more so accidents. And again, that doesn't relieve them of any of the consequences that they should face for these actions, just that they didn't mean to kill them because they didn't really know how to handle it afterwards. For example, whenever they were doing this to a 14 year old girl who died during the process, they didn't know what to do, so he quickly ran to a local hardware store, bought a bunch of cement, and then dismembered her body, encased the pieces of her in these cement blocks, and then took them to the nearby coast to throw into the ocean. However, one of these cement blocks that he had built was way too big and weighed like 200 pounds, so he just kind of sloppily rolled it out of the back of the car, to which later a fisherman saw it, thought it was weird, called the police, they cracked it open and found a body part, and then they looked and found the other body parts, to which they actually ID'd the girl who was murdered by her orthodontist equipment. Around this time, police began to get suspicious of the couple because they were reported like taking pictures of girls as they were leaving school, or just being really creepy to like teenage girls out at restaurants and stuff in the area. However, they can never get something conclusive enough to stick. That is, until one day, they kidnapped a 15-year-old girl in the middle of the street as she was walking home from school with like a whole town watching. They did this by Paul walking up behind her with a knife and then Carla grabbing her hair and then dragging her into the car. People didn't immediately recognize the couple, but it started this full scale manhunt where everyone was looking for the couple around this time. And just the next day, Carla went into work, although she was covered in several bruises because the beating that Paul did wasn't exclusive to the victims, remember, Carla also enjoyed how he would do that to her, and it's so 
awful. To which investigators around started to put together clues that they were looking for a young couple and then a young woman matching that description is beaten and bruised. So whenever she was eventually convinced to go to the hospital by her co-workers for the injuries on her, the police confronted her, said we know who you are, and she confessed. Now while it's not sure why she made this confession, and some people think maybe she had a change of heart, I disagree and I think she only did it because she realized the police are everywhere and they're probably not going to get away with this for much longer. Also, Carla cut a deal that in exchange for her testimony against Paul, she would only receive 12 years in jail. Now I know that's like nothing compared to what she deserved for the crimes that she committed, but also at the time the prosecution team did not have evidence or any idea really of the extent that this couple went to. So the idea of the battered wife who was forced into this role made sense. However, as soon as the trial started, turns out they had recorded all of these actions they committed against these girls, as well as the murders, and it was videos of Paul and Carla enjoying it during the whole thing. The prosecution then said at trial, if they had seen these tapes before, they would never have cut the 12 year deal with Carla. Carla also said that the actual number of women that Paul assaulted either with or without her is closer to around 30. However, the information that Carla brought forward was enough to get Paul put in jail for life, and again, she served 12 years and then was released. Also have to mention this side note, Paul was absolutely obsessed with the book American Psycho, which was later made into a movie. So like during this whole thing, there was never any spirit of guilt or whatever. He thought that he was cool and suave for being able to attack and kill women in this way. He essentially thought of himself as some sort of renegade or cool guy who's just outside of the system. And I wanna emphasize that for everyone out there as his next parole hearing is four days from the recording of this video or in other words, on June the 22nd of 2021. So let's hope that that doesn't happen <laughs> because after reading all the details and details of the murder and everything else that he did, I hope he rots. Because like, there's a ton of people on this list and a ton of people I've talked about already who were just awful and low down and scummy, but it's so much more annoying to me to where they think of themselves as some Superman about it and they like compare themselves to a book or movie character because they think they're just so suave for like catching and murdering women. Like it's, it's just so gross. And like th this is a little cheesy to bring up, but that Penelope Scott song, A Lot of True Crime, I've been listening to a lot while researching this because that lyric about you're not special for winning a game with someone you knew was never playing. Like, yeah, these, these guys aren't cool. They're not bad. There's not any like cool characteristic to them. They just caught someone off guard, murdered them. And then with cases like this, they think that makes them like superior for some reason. But no, you're just like a loser and a jerk. And this, I don't know who I'm talking to <laughs> because it's like, yeah, they're never going to watch. I hope they never watch this or get the opportunity to, but like it's, it's, I hate like the, okay. I hate that. This is a total weird rant has nothing to do with it. I hate like the romanticization that happens for serial killers like this. And you know, what I'm talking about people who make like the fan edits of like the Columbine shooters or Ted Bundy, because these are the most depraved, awful people in society. And then every now and then you get a loser like Paul, who thinks that makes him a cool or a bad guy. And then there's people in society who like reaffirm those characteristics. And it's just depressing that like, like bad people don't get treated as such. So I, <laughs> that was a totally random topic to get off of, of parole, but whatever, like, I just really hate these guys. <laughs> Either way, That'll do it for tier four of the serial killer iceberg. And again, I know it was only one tier and I'm sorry about that. But like I explained at the beginning and like you saw from all that information, there was a lot to go over with these guys. So rather than like skimping out, I'd re I mean, you all know I don't care about making long videos, but rather than skimping out, I would rather take the time to talk about everything in detail rather than like half covering something. Because if you're coming to this video and you're watching this, I figure, you know, you're like interested in the topic. So where's the fun in like half doing it 
when instead I could just like run through everything. So even if they take a bit longer to come out and even if it may be frustrating right now, um, I think I I'm pretty sure you all understand that like in the future, it's going to mean more that there's more content to go off of rather be because like the way I figure it is if you're watching this and uh, aside from like Ted Bundy and stuff, like say like the Paul guy I just talked about, you're not familiar with it. So you want to know. So what's the point of me leaving you all with just wanting to know more information when instead I could just give the information I've already researched, you know? But um, I I'm sure you all know that because you guys are fantastic and <laughs> you're getting me where I'm at. I think I'm like at 390,000 subscribers, which isn't a real number <laughs> and it blows my mind. And it's all thanks to you guys. You all are absolutely fantastic and it means the most. So just thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for putting up with me during the short uploads. I've been on like a kind of vacation for the past week. Um, so I know it hasn't been the most dedicated, but thank you all for sticking with me regardless. It means the most. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. Thank you to my top tier patrons, as you can see here. You guys are doing great the way you manage the Discord and the way you talk, especially like all the mods and the people in there who take care of everything. I really love you guys. And it means a lot that like, as I'm growing at, at a rate I can never imagine, and I never imagined I'd be here at any point, but at this rate that I'm growing, the fact that that's something I don't have to worry about because you guys are doing so great with it, it's really heartwarming and it really means a lot. So thank you all so much for that. I don't say that enough, but thank you. Um, thank you to all my patrons. Thank you to everyone who supports me. Thank you guys who bought the plush. I think we sold like near 900, <laughs> which is wild to me. Um, you guys have been fantastic. So there's going to be more content coming up soon. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going to be next. I really want to do a video relating to psychopaths, which isn't like specific to this iceberg or serial killers, just its own thing. Um, but we'll see how that goes. But either way, I hope that you enjoyed. I hope that this wasn't too boring. Uh, and thank you all so much for watching. It really does mean the most. So uh, hopefully, uh, you all like this video and Either way, I will see you in the next one.